Welcome to the Firebelly Social Show. We're focused on talking to food and beverage brands that are on a mission to make the world better. Hey, 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 everyone. Duncan here with another episode of the Firebelly Social Show, where we feature leaders and founders of mission-driven food and beverage brands. And I'm so excited to be here. We have a great guest. And so thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, today we're going to be talking with Bedantis, the co-founder of Frutero Natural Foods. This episode is brought to you by Firebelly Marketing. At Firebelly, we help mission-based food and beverage brands bring people closer together through social media. So if you're ready to use social media, create more community and excitement around your food and beverage brand, go to firebellymarketing.com to learn more. So now with no further ado, let me tell you about my man Vedant Sabu, who's joining us from Frutero Natural Foods. He, much like myself, he grew up in India, came to the United States to go to school to get an MBA at none other than Wharton. And um, having previously worked in big companies, the man decided to leave all these high paying jobs to focus on his true passion and making people better. So, hey, Vedant, uh, welcome to the show, my man. Thank you so much, Duncan. Very excited to be here. So let's let's talk about this. How did you and your business partner Mike meet, and how did you decide on tropical ice creams? So, uh, Duncan, as as you mentioned, I came to the United States in 2018, and uh, I and Mike, who's who's now my partner in crime, we were assigned to sit next to each other on the first day of class, uh, and. The story was we, we became very good friends in the, in the next six months. And one fine day, I and Mike said to each other, we don't want to do a go to job anymore. Why do we start a business? Okay, so we wanted to start a business, but we had no idea what kind of business we were going to start. So as, as good consultants do, we made an 82 idea list. Uh, and one of them was to do this tropical fruit ice cream. And then Mike was taking a trip to India and I said, you know what, Mike, you don't see ice cream is such a popular dessert in the United States, but you just do not see any tropical fruit. Whereas if you go to countries like India or Latin America, you don't see much of chocolate and vanilla, you actually see more of fruit ice cream because that's regarded as more premium, more natural. So I said, why don't you go and give it a sh- taste when you're in India. And if you think this could make sense, we will try. And then he loved it. I started making it in my apartment. Our friends at Wharton loved it. And then we looked at each other and we said, oh, looks like we have a business here. And that was the genesis of Fruitero. That's the genesis, right? It's always uh, the the good founders always see the need firsthand. You know, they're, uh... and the thing is, that's interesting, right? Is when I was growing up, uh, you know, but a couple of generations before you, it's like you didn't get ice cream every day at home in India, right? You what you get? You got fruit, and that was considered to be like good living, right? Your your luxurious living is you're getting fruit. Then maybe once a week you'd go, you know, to the ice cream shop, and uh, man, that was a good day, right? But um, tell me more about the flavors that you guys are doing. This is just fascinating to me. So so you're right, Daku. You know, fruit is nature's dessert. Ice cream is America's dessert. And we combine both of them. That's what is Frutero all about. And the flavors we have is all sorts of amazing flavors. So you have what I would say slightly mainstream or popular flavors like coconut, mango, to not so popular like guava, passion fruit, to exotic like guanabana, which is essentially sour soap and extremely, extremely popular uh, in India and Latin America. In India, it's called Sita Fall. Uh, so that's that's the fruit sour soap. Uh, we have some new uh, entrants too, like banana, pina colada. So these are some of the new lychee is the lychee. new flavor that is really gained traction among our, our core fan base. That's amazing, lychee. I'm so happy to to hear that. I actually didn't know the English word uh, or the name for Sita Fallen. What is it again? So Guanabana is actually the Spanish version, uh, but the English name is either sour sap or custard apple. Custard apple. Uh, yep. Mm-hmm. 
And for those people that don't know what a custard apple is, you're truly missing out. I mean, it is a phenomenal, phenomenal tasting fruit. And of course, on the streets of Bombay, you can have it, um, you know, late at night. Um, um, I'm trying to think what's the name of Pearl's Necklace, right? It's like a Chopati area. You can get it in a little fresh right there in front of you. So that's amazing. Wow. Now let's 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 say um, you know you guys you're, you're going to Wharton, you're getting this business figured out, and then COVID comes along. God damn COVID. <laughs> God damn COVID. And I think, Duncan, if uh, I would say if COVID was a few months earlier, we might have never started the business. Uh, luckily, I and Mike decided to put in money in February of 2020. Uh, and the putting in money was literally giving the money to our co-packer to say, yes, you can now produce $20,000 worth of ice cream and we'll sell it on in, in these summers. Little did we know that COVID was hitting and no business would be there or no but no grocery store wanted to talk to us and why would they they were all struggling to just get the basic necessities stocked up in their shelf they were not caring about you know some exotic fruit ice cream that was not essential so i think the first few months were like real challenge uh i think mike and i were okay because uh all of our friends and we're still in philadelphia they couldn't go to any of that plans uh, of, you know, visiting different countries or starting their jobs because every job was postponed. So it was a party time for everybody, frankly, at that point. Uh, but slowly and steadily, we were we still managed to do $250,000 in sales that year, uh, you know, through our bodega channels, through so many other. And I think we got it to Whole Foods that year in five stores in Philadelphia. So we really... Did strive and try to do our best, uh, but yes, it was challenging. And what I loved about your story, as I was reading up, is that you traveled to correct me twelve hundred uh, bodegas and um, or more, and just kind of checking out what people would like and meeting people. And I mean, that is um, that is the way to roll. You know, just meeting people firsthand. Oh, absolutely. And I think, Duncan, I haven't lost that yet. So I still do the exact same thing, not so much more often. But going to those 1,200 bodegas in and around Philadelphia and getting people to try that and seeing that expression actually helped us identify the what is the emotion that we are selling. Because we're not just selling a product. And, and as you know, in consumer product, Every consumer, particularly premium product, is selling an emotion. And I think that was able to very quickly for me and Mike articulate what is that emotion that we're selling. And I suppose depending on the person, it's it's a it's a very positive uh, emotion, but it could be just pure joy or happiness or even nostalgia. Oh, 100%. It is. Nostalgia is one of the biggest uh, thing. And, uh, you know, the name Frutero is Spanish for fruit vendor, right? So this is not just a mango ice cream. It's the best mango ice cream and it tastes better than the mangoes that you have in your produce section. To communicate all of this, you really have to... Uh, you know, of course, tasting is believing. When you try Frutano, you understand what I'm talking about. Uh, but beyond that, and probably we will dig deeper on this, how this defines our social mission and how also it defines our awareness creation or, or fan base creation in our business. Well, that's amazing um, that you guys are um, featuring these tropical fruits from all around the world. What's the sourcing uh, look and feel like? Do you, are you traveling to find things? Or how are you doing all that? Oh, 100%. So we traveled across. Uh, I, I went to Colombia. We first, of course, we tried all the fruits from across different parts of the world in my port. And trust me, it was rejection after rejection. We just couldn't find the right fruit. Uh, as you know, the fruits here in the U.S. introduced actually they were plugged 30 days or 40 days before the product was wrapped. So case in point, 
a grocery store when get strawberries in their store they will reject the lord if the strawberries are not some portion of them are not green right because the strawberries are just going to go get spoiled by the time three days so mangoes you see in grocery store were plucked 60 days before they actually went right now monkeys in all the tropical countries they know when is the best time to pluck the mango <laughs> which is when it is absolutely about to fall because then the fruit has achieved the peak flavor so i think the biggest thing for us was to identify the fruit identify the places where we could have a supply chain so that the fruits are plucked right and prepared immediately and then transported to the U.S. to really capture that peak flavor of those fruits. We're locking in the flavor at the peak moment. So it's it's more about, it's, it's interesting, I was talking to a, a guy named uh, Jordan Russell who has a, a coconut water company called Ra, R-A. And he was saying the same thing. He said that you got to focus on the best quality, you know, there's a lot of coconut water companies that are blending coconuts, you know, and to to get the price down. But what you're saying, in fact, is that the quality is what determines the experience. And so you're chasing the best quality and let the price fall where it falls. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, most of our a lot of our fruits come from Colombia. And how does that supply chain work really is. Uh, Unlike in the U.S., Colombia, and most of the tropical regions are developing markets. They yet do not have a very strong dominance of industrial players in their farming. So you have very small localized farmers who are growing fruits in their small farm. What we do essentially that is you identify a region which grows a certain kind of fruit. You create a cooperative with those farmers and you have this one farmer with takes the ownership of transporting and collecting all these. So our product, these fruits, the mangoes which we use in our mango or, or the guanabana which we use in our well, they are picked by hand by a farmer, collected during the day. So, you know, like for instance, I, I, when I visited uh, guanabana farms in, in Fresno region of Colombia, uh, the gentleman there is Don Augusto. What he does is he has these 200 farmers in that region and every Wednesday morning, he would, every farmer knows that this is the collection day. So they will start picking up product in the morning from their farms. All of them will then now bring it to one particular destination at 8 p.m. in the night. The biggest farmer owns the truck and he will put all of it and next day morning, 7 a.m., it shows up in the plant in Medin. And then it gets prepared. So the pulp is extracted, it is frozen, and then we transport it to the U.S. So the, this supply chain in creating the sanctity of the product is, is the core that why we exist. That's amazing. I love the story. I love the fact that, and maybe this is part of your mission, I love the fact that you are supporting uh, farmers at a grassroots level because my sense is that any of those farmers don't produce a high enough volume to sell to any any major player, right? It's like they they just I mean, it's not sustainable for the player to go to play to uh, farms that are that small. But in your case, because of the system you have set up, not only do you get this superior product. But it's also a lot more viable because of the way the, the network has been built and the way it's all happening at the at the farmer level. No, hundred percent. And I, I would say probably I would add in Colombia it's also another advantage. Now Colombia, as we all know, is the biggest exporter of illegal uh, products. Right? You're talking about coca plants, cocaine. The reason why farmers are really incentivized in growing those products is because there's always a buyer and the price never fluctuates. Now we realize that if we give the exact same incentive to the farmers in terms of whatever you grow, we will buy. And we will buy at this price throughout the year. We give the same incentive for them to grow fruits, but no risk of 
you know, political, economic, or violent risks. So we really see that a lot many farmers start growing more of these uh, fruits instead of growing something else, and that it's such cultural and family values there, right? Generations and generations, they want to grow this product. And it, it, it's very, very interesting uh, to kind of see how this is playing out. Yeah, it's phenomenal. I love it. Now, let me let me ask you this. What gets you, uh, what gets you excited about all of this? I think two things, uh, Duncan. I think number one is whenever somebody tries through tarot, just look at the smile. That's why we started and that's why we exist. I think that's the number one reason that it gives me guys. And number two is uh, our mission is to hunt, protect, and fight for the best fruits. And that really drives me because I have spent my childhood and probably you yours as well being close to these fruits, right? A big portion of family interaction was having these fruits particularly when you're kids with your cousins and you know how big families are in India. Uh, so you would, this is a part of our enjoyment and our ability to connect with nature. And I think we feel that we are custodians just like those fruiteros in, in tropical fruit or in India, they're called the falwalas, right? The one fruit who wala. takes the cart, the fruit wala, the, the one who takes the cart. You never buy a fruit from the grocery store in you buy fruits from those people, those carts. And, and we are their custodians. Our, our job is just as their job in the modern era, which is to protect the quality and integrity of the of the taste of these fruits. And we are not the ice cream company first. We are the fruit company first. That's amazing. I love the, the fruit voila um, um, analogy there because, uh, I mean, you know, and the other thing that I love is that, you know, in, oh. fruits only have a certain season, right? And so the quality of the fruit when you eat it, like you were mentioning before we got on the call about, you know, eating uh, uh, regional mangoes or local mangoes from Ranchi and how those mangoes taste totally different. It's like all mangoes are not created equal, right? And there's going to be mangoes that appeal to you that don't appeal to someone else and you're... And, what are you doing with? Um, I guess I'm I'm all over the place at the moment. But what 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 are you excited about? What's coming up next in terms of flavors? So I think mean, we're excited about two things really. And number one is the flavor extension, right? So lychee, as I mentioned, banana, uh, chiku, or or uh, that's one of the uh, another flavor that we are experimenting with. Tamarind uh, is another flavor that is that is coming up. So I'm very excited for this flavor, but actually more so I'm excited about form change. So, you know, right now our products come in pints. So there are 16 fluid ounce pints. But we have observed there is, there is one kind of demographic that is buying the pints. Normally young couples or people who are old or empty nesters. We're not attacking the childhood or the households with children. So we really want to kind of change uh, or, or add new forms. So, so the next biggest thing I'm excited about is our bars. So they are ice cream on the stick. So they are not like, uh, you know, like popsicles, which are just very syrupy and sugary. No, they are real ice cream, which melts in your mouth the same way as a real ice cream would, but on a stick. And the, another innovation of the farm, farm that we are working on is actually fruit bites. So having small ice cream, so small mango pieces covered with ice cream and may have a chocolate covering that's like a very, very initial stage right now. But how can we get more into snacking where the world is going and give this fruit snacking feel to people? I mean, that's phenomenal. Um... I, I think that's actually like market development and um, based on what, what people are doing. You're right. I mean, people are stacking more. And um, even people that are super healthy, you know, and maybe don't normally eat ice cream would be, uh, I think, tempted to try something that's so heavily fruit-based. 
A hundred percent. You know, uh, the other good thing about Frutera or eating fruit ice cream in general, which is made from real fruit, is it's automatically 30 to 40 percent lower in calories because 30 to 40 percent of what you're eating is fruit. Uh, and it's not extremely indulgent as you would say like a cheesecake ice cream or a peanut butter ice cream, just because 30 to 40 percent of what you're eating is fruit. Having said that, I think our job is to really, as I said, about the fruits. So we're not married to ice cream. I think when I see the purpose and mission over many years for this company, it's really about uh, giving people the right fruits in whatever form they desire. So it could be, you know, different kind of snacking in the future. It could be different kind of juices in the future. That's really the purpose. You know, uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Jeremy Wise, um, who runs a company called Rise 25, his daughters who are, you know, very young in, you know, in their double digit years, so you know, very young preteens, do this um, freeze dried um, project every year where they, you know, they call themselves the, 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 J, the J sisters. And um, that immediately made me think of that as like, how great is it? There's no, almost no preservatives. It's just freeze dried, and when you eat the mango slices, it just explodes in your mouth, and it's so good. And there's nothing on it, and I think that's the that's the challenge that a lot of people are looking at these days. Is like there's so much shit in everything you buy, you can't pronounce half the stuff. You don't know what it is, which is why I love Malk so much. I don't know if you're familiar with Malk. It's um, the oat 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 milk, and there's nothing in it. And um, the the CEO uh, Jason uh, was on our podcast, and it's like he said, it's like there's nothing in it but oat, you know. And um, this, that's that's the beauty, I think, of where you're going. I love the idea of uh, delivering fruit in whatever form people people would like to consume it. No, hundred percent. I think Doug, the one thing that the U United States consumer as every few decades gets a change in the palate, right? Uh, you know, a few years ago, of course, it was Italian with the pizzas and, and so on. And the recent buzz these days is, of course, Latin American cuisine, particularly Mexican cuisine and coming everywhere. But I think when you think about fruits, a lot of people in the United States are not aware of these fruits. However, as the world is becoming globalized, right? Like, for instance, um, you know, there is a company called Truly or White Claw, right? Which just took the new age beer equivalent without the calories. But look at their flavors. Their flavors are passion fruit, pomegranate. I think that palate change is happening as we speak. It requires more work, particularly when you have to kind of help the consumer distinguish between what is the real flavor of mango. So in our industry, when, when I think about getting mango, right, it's less so much about artificial sweeteners or things, but because of the popularity of all of those things, there is a certain change in the palate or expectation from people. It becomes difficult for an American consumer to say, because they're so accustomed to these artificial flavors added in anything which is mango, they don't know what is the true taste of it. So sometimes I think the biggest challenge we as a company or we as an industry face is to really get our consumers to taste, try, and appreciate the true flavor of, of these products. And it's um it's a it's a it's an amazing insight. I think the same actually exists for vegetables and meat people don't even know i mean when you start like you know if you're a meat eater you go to a butcher shop where the meat is coming the chicken or the beef is coming directly from a small farm my experience has been is that the taste of that um product that chicken or beef is extremely different you can actually taste it i remember when i first came to america i was like man the chicken here doesn't taste like anything right in India, man, it's strong. There's a strong chicken flavor, right? I mean, it's almost gamey. And I think it's the same thing, even with, with avocados. It's like, man, there are times when you buy an avocado and it's not even close to right. It has to sit for two weeks. So 
It's really, it's really interesting what you're doing. Uh, I guess my question after all the rambling is, what role does education play in all of this for you guys? So I think it is taste. The biggest thing is you really need to taste. Like for instance, Dung, you mentioned avocados, right? You go to a grocery store that is Latin American grocery store or a Hispanic grocery store. Say in, in the West, we have Vallartas in, in uh, Los Angeles. Um, and you see the avocados there. And the next part is you go and you see an avocado in a Walmart. And then you go and see an avocado in, in a Whole Foods. Very different avocados. Very different avocados. I think the only, the biggest education, and it, it takes decades for, is for them to taste the product. So I think when we think about our education, our marketing spend for the next month or next year, 2024, now of course we're hitting the winter months, but it's really about driving a massive sampling program. Uh, it's interesting that this is not something that we have thought of. Every major ice cream company which has been successful, including companies like Ben and Jerry's, Ben and Jerry, the two individuals, all they did was to put it in people's mouth and to let them appreciate how you can make a cheesecake ice cream so indulgent, so nutty, so full of flavors, right? And at that point in time, they were doing the exact same thing. The other alternative at that point of the market was very low butter fat, more air, cheaper version of ice cream, right? And they did this sampling to tell everybody how amazing and indulgent ice cream get, can see. That's the exact same thing we have to do. Uh, it's so surprising. I mean, even today, whenever I send it to anybody or an, the single most what is that I received from them as a reaction is not, oh, it was great. I was surprised how great it was. And underline the word surprised here, right? Uh, so you have to really get them to try to see, oh, I was surprised that really how a good mango tastes. Uh, but I think that is something which we need to do in terms of education. Breaking down those barriers, right? Those barriers of just not knowing and being in a in a in a comfort in a comfortable place almost right. It's like why every time you go get an ice cream, why are you eating vanilla ice cream? God damn, you've eaten vanilla ice cream your whole life, right? Try a Sita Fall ice cream. Exactly, exactly. And people try, and they're like, "Oh my god!" And we have got you know, um, Sita Fall ice cream goes very good with apple pie. That's something which I learned from our fans. Because somebody tried it and then they said, oh my God, I put it in my apple pie during the holidays when everybody was here. And then you hear stories like, you know, oh my God, I I I grew up in, in Dominican Republic, you know, one of our fans. And she saw this and she said, oh my God, my mother used to make this. My grandmother used to make shakes out of it. It's not just that I want to try it. I want to take it and to my office and try to all those other 12 people who have no idea about this, just so that I can tell them this is what it is to grow up, to live in Dominican Republic and to kind of build a uh, you know, cultural uh, community. It's like you really trying to show it in your community that this, this is the fruit which I grew up with, like, you know? Um, so I think that's very, very uh, interesting. Vedant, how do you um, and Mike uh, take care of yourselves? You know, how it would, I mean, obviously founder life and startup life is very difficult. How do you, uh, how do you make sure you're taking care of yourself? No, I think, uh, Duncan, the biggest thing for them is to be surrounded with people who understand and like you. I think Mike and I, um, we have traveled the world now, I would say, and we've also been into different locations, building the business in the United States. Um, I think within us, the number one thing that helps us is, is the understanding which we have. The number two thing is, you know, it's, I would say it's not as difficult to be a founder as people think sometimes. It is very challenging because, uh, you know, you have the sole responsibility. There is nobody else taking the responsibility of the company. But at the same time, you do not have 
somebody where you have to face time or you have to be in the work just because it's something new. It's very independent in good life. And I think for people who kind of value that, you can automatically start taking the, the, the stress level. Um, and we kind of, uh, I travel a lot. Mike has a little one, one and a half year old. She was born a year ago. Um, and uh, it has been amazing. Um, and, you know, we have our partners. We have a sales broker team. We have our manufacturers. We have people in Colombia who help us. Um, I think we have been very lucky to to get a very good buy-in at an early stage from all of them. Um, and they're good people, so that just reduces our stress level because uh, they are handling it pretty well, what they do. That's beautiful. Well, let's make sure that uh, we give a shout out to Mike, your partner, for all his support and hard work and the relationship that you guys have and doing what you do and the community you've built. And I want to thank you, uh, you know, as a leader, it's my sense that we don't get thanked enough. And I want to thank you on behalf of Arnal, who's not here today, and myself, and, and doing this to make the world a better place. So uh, before we forget, though, where can people uh, buy the product? So Frutaro ice creams are available in most big grocery stores across the East Coast. Um, so from Boston to Miami, uh, you can find it within a few miles of your house in any major grocery store, whether it be Publix, Whole Foods, Stop and Shop, ShopRite, Acme, Safeway, um, Shaw's. So all of these places do carry Frutaro uh, flavors. That's wonderful. And also, they can order online too, right? They can. They can order online. Uh, and in fact, if you order online, you get a bigger spectrum of flavors. So the new flavors you're talking about are currently only available online. Uh, so you get that. It comes in a box of six or a box of 12. Uh, you order it and we ship it within two working days. That's amazing. So everyone, check this out. It really is a mind-bending experience um, to see these exotic fruits um, coming to you in their best possible form. And uh, we're so happy that you're doing this. And I still, I'm still struck by the the beautiful insight that you will extend your product line in, uh, of fruits into whatever form people want to consume them. So thanks uh, again for everything you do. Um, and um, before we leave. Uh, the podcast is brought to you by Firebelly Marketing, where we help mission-driven food and beverage brands uh, with social media marketing. And uh, this has been another episode of the Firebelly Social Show, chatting with uh, Vedan Sabu uh, from Frutero. And uh, hey, we see you on the on the next one. Thanks again, Vedan. Thank you so much, Duncan. Really appreciate your time today. See you next time. Thanks for listening to the Firebelly Social Show. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.